Hello, and welcome back. It's me, Valerie Monroe. And me, Bookwormy. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What's the matter? I thought you said that we weren't going to be reading anymore. No, I said come back today and we'll have something else to read. That will be a lot of fun. Oh, thank goodness. I was so worried we wouldn't be reading anymore. What else would we do with the books? We could always taste them and chew them. I think that's a terrible idea. I think reading will be so much better. Well, I am glad to be here. Me too, because I'm really glad you're here. Do you think they like seeing a little bookworm like me? I think everybody just loves seeing a little bookworm like you. But for right now, I'm going to sit you down because I'd like to talk a little bit about the end of Down the Swale, and then I'm going to start a new book. Oh, this is very, very exciting. Thank you. Well, if you were with us in the last episode, we finished Down the Swale. I thought it was a great ending. And I want to talk about what part, some parts of the book that were not true and um, how I used those ideas in the story in kind of a fun way. So when I was writing the book, I really wanted to use some kind of water monster. I did not want to use the Loch Ness Monster because I thought that Loch Ness Monster has gotten a lot of attention. And so I started researching other lochs or lakes in Scotland. There's loads of them and all of them are very, very beautiful. But I came across one called Loch Morar which is in the northern part of Scotland. And it is actually the deepest lake in all of Europe. And people there believe that there is a lock creature there called Morag. And as I was reading, I came across a book, you know, where people had done a lot of research on this and found out that there were two men in 1969, Duncan McDonnell and William Simpson. They had gone out in a fishing boat together, and while they were out there that evening, they said a creature that was about 20 to 30 feet long actually bumped into their boat. And it startled them so much that um, McDonald tried, grabbed an oar and tried to attack it. Simpson shot at it with his rifle, and the creature just disappeared under the water. Later, a lot of people interviewed them, and they kept, they stuck to their story and said they really did see a creature. Um, that had rough, dirty brown skin, three humps, and a snake-like head. So a few years after um, I wrote the book, I decided to go to Scotland and visit Loch Morar, where Morag supposedly lives. And lo and behold, I found out that the two men, Duncan McDonald and William Simpson, I found out they had lived close to there and that one of them was still alive. Duncan McDonald has had um, passed away. I was able to visit his gravesite, but I want to show you, this is a picture of Willie Simpson, who is simp in the story. He's kind of the meaner one in the story. And he stuck to his story. When I talked to him about, you know, I asked him questions. Did you really see something that day? He stuck to his story. He really believes there was a creature in the lock that day. And so that was a that was just a picture of me giving him a copy of Down the Swale. Um, another interesting part about Down the Swale that's actually true is the names of the two aunts, Aunt Hazel and Aunt Gladys. They really were my aunts. Neither one is alive anymore, but they were wonderful, wonderful people. Aunt Gladys, just like she is in the book, is a little bit sterner, was a little bit sterner. Aunt Hazel was a whole lot of fun. And I wanted to honor them by using their names and their personalities in the book. Now, I told you we would start something new. Luckily, I've written another book, the second in the trilogy, Journey to Naguanis. And I hope you really, really enjoy this. In some ways, I like this book even more because it's it goes back to some unfinished business from the first book. Down the Swale was a story that took place in the spring, if you remember, and this one starts in autumn. So this is chapter one. The first whiff of fall, which carried the smoke of burning logs through the hills of Lake Wahakmo, was Aunt Gladys's call to arms. 
She summoned Brogdon and Aunt Hazel to a family meeting at the kitchen table an hour after breakfast. Using a large maple leaf that had begun to change color as a pointer, she indicated that they sit on either side of her. Why, sister, gasped Aunt Hazel, what a marvelous leaf. I don't believe I've ever seen that particular pattern before. It brings to mind, it brings to mind, sister Aunt Gladys cut in sharply, that autumn is fast upon us. In a mere number of weeks, before we can even say Jack Frost, the trees will be bare, the snow will pile deep, and the bitter cold will render us homebound. Oh, Peashaw, Anne Hazel replied, let us not get ahead of ourselves and wish our lives away. We should enjoy these days and spend our time marveling at nature's dazzling palette. Anne Hazel saying, why work? Just sit outside and enjoy the view, enjoy those changing colors of the leaves. Oh, certainly not, scoffed Aunt Gladys. We mustn't dawdle. If we want to have food on this table, when winter knocks at our door, we must begin harvesting. Rodin remained silent throughout his aunt's banter. He already knew there was no arguing with Aunt Gladys. He was just waiting to find out which chore she had in mind for him. And it didn't take long to find out either. She lifted a stack of baskets from the corner of the room and deposited them in the middle of the table. Hazel, she directed, twigs for firewood, please. And Broughton, the willow bark. We will never survive the chill of winter without mugs of warm willow bark tea. Here's a piece of willow bark. This is what she's talking about. This came from my tree outside. She handed him a long-handled basket. Yes, Aunt Gladys, Brogdon said dutifully. He was, however, smiling on the inside. Although gathering bark was technically a chore, it was always thrilling to climb the willow tree. Grabbing the basket, he dashed for the door. Before he got there, however, Aunt Hazel stepped in and quickly barred his way. Brogdon, she began earnestly. Although it may seem somewhat redundant, there is something I must say. Brogdon knew what was coming. If he'd heard Aunt Gladys' speech once, he'd heard it a hundred times. He could recite it from memory, in fact, but out of, aunt, out of respect for his aunt, he remained silent. I know that Hazel agrees with me when I say that we can never take the place of your parents. However, since the day that they were, she bowed her head at this point, like always, lost down the swale, we have loved you as our own. It broke our hearts when we thought you were dead this past summer. She reached out and placed her hand on Aunt Hazel's shoulder, who nodded gravely in agreement. And so, Aunt Gladys continued, we are asking you to please exercise the greatest of caution while you are out and about. And above all, she finished sternly, stay away from the swale. I will, broke to me a shorter. I promise. And he meant it too. He cared deeply for his aunts and did not wish to cause them further worry. Just the willow tree and nothing else. Grinning at both of them, he grabbed a small basket, then let himself out the door and into the bright morning sunshine. Well, there were several, several willow trees near their home, but the sweetest bark came from the tallest one, which was in a neighboring yard. Getting there required climbing up and over a cement wall covered in ivy which he th thought was just about the most fun someone could have. Brogdon was afoot, one of the Lake Wahakmo folks who stood only a foot tall, but his size did not stop him from doing anything. Just this past summer, he had been on a grand adventure that resulted in saving Maggie, a baby lock monster, from two ruthless money-hungry hunters named Mackie and Simp. Since summer's end, however, his life had been quite uneventful. Chores and projects in the brown hut where he and his aunts lived filled up most of his days. He was so excited to be out on his own at the moment that he hopped and skipped over the newly fallen leaves. Oh, there was plenty to see on the way to the cement wall. For example, he couldn't help himself from peering into dark chipmunk holes. The chipmunks were also preparing for the winter season. So the holes were all empty. And then he plucked a thick strand of grass from the ground, held it to his lips, and blew three loud squeaky whistles. They echoed through the air, and a raven cawed in response, 
as it glided overhead. You might want to do that tomorrow. Go outside, find a piece of grass, put it in between your hands and see if you can whistle with that. You need a pretty thick piece of grass. When he was almost to the wall, Brogdon picked up a sparkly rock from the ground. He dusted it off and realized that it was a small chunk of marble with lots of graphite crystals. Anne Hazel often took him mineral hunting, and he was becoming fairly good at identifying them on his own. He placed it in his pocket and then hoisted first the basket and then himself onto the top of the ivy-colored wall. Covered wall. The dark green vines were slippery as he descended with the basket looped over his arm. Every few inches, he paused to take a look around. He was about halfway down when three spiders crawled over beside him. Each one swung from a fine silken thread. Web weavers club, the largest of the spiders explained as they passed by him. It's the last Monday of the month, and this is our normal practice route. No problem at all, smiled Brogdon. He leaned slightly to make room for the spiders to pass. Can you picture them swinging on their little silken threads? They disappeared within seconds, and all that remained of them were silvery threads swaying back and forth. Brogdon continued along the vine, and when he was close enough, he dropped to the ground with a thud. Then he leaned back against the wall to catch his breath and get his bearings. He saw a cluster of raspberry bushes between the wall and the willow tree and decided that he would pick a few berries as a surprise for his aunts. And then a dark shadow nixed his idea completely. And that's where we'll stop for today. No, don't stop. We have to stop. It's almost time for dinner here. What do you think that dark shadow was? I'm not telling. You know the only way to find out, right? Join us again tomorrow for more of Journey to Nagwanis. Join us tomorrow. We can't wait to see you. Bye, everybody.